Co tu się
Believe it or not, is the Zappos.com website from not that long ago. <laughs> I think this is beginning of 2006. Um, 2006, that's the same time that that Mac book was out. And this company was funded. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so was your, was, your, was your logo the way it was? Like, no. same logo? <laughs> but there, there's an important thing I want to talk about right this. Like, in 2006, what the Zappos brand was, and what it is now are totally different things. And what our customers wanted with the Zappos brand were totally different then than what they want now for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, brand identity is one of them. You know, when you have a, a stronger brand, people are going to you know, expect more from you. When you're still growing, um, you have some you know, uh, forgivings that, that you can make. And in our case, believe it or not, we were a company that was selling everything online. Our website was not the most important piece of our business. In 2006, it was all about speed, and I'll talk about speed, there's many meanings for that word, efficiency, and deep linked converts. But we didn't really pay much attention to whether our site was designed well or not. When I say design, I'm talking about the site by itself. We cared an awful lot about how the experience was designed. So let me talk a little bit about speed. You know, when people were buying stuff online, what was really important um, was that the site loaded quickly and that people got their products really fast. So, um, I'm going to butcher the numbers a little bit, but generally speaking, for every 100 milliseconds of something undetectable to you, of slowdown for the website, re resulted in approximately a 1% conversion decrease. So if you're selling a couple million dollars a day and your site slows down by 100 milliseconds, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars that you're sacrificing. It's ridiculous. Amazon follows that rule to a T right now, and it's probably one of the reasons why they invest so heavily in technology. And also one of the reasons why you don't see them taking huge, ginormous design risks on the site, because for them, if they're selling maybe $10 million a day, they decrease their conversion by 1%. That's something, probably easy math that I can't do in my head right now. It's a lot. <laughs> um, and, you know, it all boils back down to efficiency too, but I want to talk about deep link uh, converts. Um, we, the brand wasn't terribly recognized in the early 2000s. I would say 2006 became the year that exactly was started becoming somewhat of a household name in the States, but we were hugely reliant on our affiliates. Um, our affiliates are, you guys know what affiliates are? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Right. Not sure, some of um, We were highly dependent on our affiliates driving traffic to us. We were highly dependent on <laughs> comparison shopping engines, meaning engines that are just you know, showing you the cheapest products and you click on them and you go directly to a product page. But what didn't matter uh, was, uh, was didn't matter as much was our was our homepage, was our searching, was how people found product on our site because close to 50% of people were finding product from other sites rather than directly into our product page, which basically meant we had we had we were given the opportunity to focus elsewhere. So this is where most people were landing when um, they were being brought to us by affiliates, and this is the product pizza page. No, it's definitely not the sexiest thing in the world, but if you were to land here. It's pretty clear what you can do. You can pick your size, <coughs> and uh, you can add something to your cart. That was the most important user action we needed to satisfy at the time. Um, that was until our brand became more recognized, and we started having people coming directly to us. So things started changing. And at the time, we recognized very specifically that users have very specific goals and expectations. And in that case, it was just get me the product and get me out. Um, and as experience designers, I think you hear me use experience designers more than you hear me say user experience design, because there's connotations. Uh, user experience design, often people relegate that to creating a website or a web app or some digital product. To me, experience design is arguably more important. You know, it's, it's talking about everything, everything we do has an impact on the customer, whether it's on the site or not. So what we do has to mean something. So I'll ask you a question, like when do you interact with a product? You know, you may interact with a product while you're at your, at your office working. I like the bottom thing. Too. Women work all the time, and I have to put up signs when they work. <laughs> uh, you interact with a product at your house, right? Um, you may interact with a product on the go. Um, clearly, mobile devices are, uh, I would say, probably used more often than most of us on our, our laptops. And you interact with a product possibly when you receive it, right? It's a physical good, also. It's not just. It's not just you know a digital product. So for us, we always view the, the Zappos product as the experience. The experience was in large part getting your product, your, your package. So at the end of the day, experiences are just touch points, right? 
They're just things that you engage with, not much else. So the way, the way I typically you know, view this is that experience design should include many things, but very clearly your website, your apps, your Twitter account, your Facebook, it's everything. It's every opportunity that a user has to interact with your brand. And fortunately for us at Zappos, you know, in the, what was called the user experience department at the time, we weren't relegated to just creating wireframes or relegated to just improving the website. We had opportunities to you know, touch our customers, <laughs> impact our customers uh, at, at every touch point. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> but, but really, you know, everybody, everybody who um, works for your brand, everyone who has a say in the business are essentially the experienced designers for your, for your company because we all have an impact ultimately in what the end product is. So whether you know, you're a biz dev person talking to clients or you're someone behind the scenes developing for that company, you're all actually experienced designers for the thing that the biz dev person is talking to their clients. There's really no differentiation and there shouldn't be. Um, but an experience really, at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's a representation of who you are as a people. So you think about your, your culture, the culture here. I mean, you're gonna hire people who, who represent your culture, right? You're not gonna hire someone who's a super wizard engineer but a total asshole. It, does, it doesn't represent your brand. It doesn't represent the experience you're trying to create when folks like me, I guess, do you use the word clients here? Clients? I don't like the word clients, but I'll be one today. Clients in here, right? It's like every single person I see is a representation of the experience you're working with with Applicate. So I'll talk a little bit about how we did things at Zappos, and you may have heard about this, but for every single person who worked there, whether you're the CTO, which uh, one came in a couple years ago, or the COO, a new one who started after I left, no matter what, your first four weeks are answering telephones. doesn't matter, no matter what. And there's a big reason for that, right? So every, every single person, no matter what job you're doing, I was just saying earlier, touches the customer experience. So if you're an engineer, the, the products and uh, uh, software you're making is going to impact the customer experience. Even if you're a financial person, it's going to impact the customer experience. You know, how, you know, how quickly we could credit your returns impacts the customer experience. So in order to make sure everyone's truly intimately involved with the customers, we had to spend four weeks talking to them, eight hours a day, sometimes more. I remember actually time talking to a customer where you know, she was asking me my advice on these black high heels. And she was like, <laughs> yeah. she, called, no, she calls me up, well, didn't call me, he called Zappos, I answered the phone. And we're, we're chatting and she's, you know, <clears throat> telling me the link she's viewing. I'm looking through it, there's 90 pages of black high heels. And we clicked through about 40 of them before she finally said, you know what, uh, I'm probably not interested. So I spent about an hour on the phone talking to her about high heels. But I tell you what, take, knowing that experience, having that experience right there, when I went back to my desk, you know, a month later, I knew we had a problem because we couldn't, you know, for someone to have to thumb through 40 pages of black shoes is completely and utterly ridiculous. You shouldn't have to do that. But how would I have truly understood that was a real problem unless I had that conversation with that person? <coughs> yeah, I look at the analytics, but what do the analytics tell you? They tell you faceless data. It's not terribly useful by itself. Um, so, you know, I definitely have a belief that, you know, one-to-one -one contact with your customers is absolutely necessary. If you don't do that, I don't think you can create a product that truly resonates or truly, you know, works for, for a customer unless you have that intimate knowledge. Um, your instincts, they certainly play a part. I mean, we all specialize in what we do. We have a knack for what we do, but we're not all necessarily the best at what we do, right? We could always learn, learn more, we could always improve. So I think, you know, instincts combined with, this is hard to read, with your research, with, you know, constant feedback and personal connections actually, to me, are the, are the layers that create you know, the right tool set to connect with your customers and, and create good experiences. So I do have a story to tell about that. And in the interest of not creating public slander, I'm not sure if it's illegal here, but it's illegal in the States. I'm not going to mention the company's name, but I will call it FS. Yeah. And there, and there it's not Future Simple. Let's hear it. It's not Future Simple. <laughs> 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 it's a pretty popular up and coming uh, company in New York, and everyone raves about it. People are using it. Um, it's theoretically cool. And I met the founder one day, and he uh, totally treated me like a jerk. He belittled me, and, and just 
my first my first interaction with that with that company was that founder who gave me no respect, who basically showed me what he, what he was all about, and I instantly associated him with this product, and now I'm on a mission to make sure I'm promoting that person's competitors as often as I possibly can. <laughs> but because that person is an extension, that person is that brand, right? I, didn't even, I haven't even used that used their, their digital product. I, I interacted with the person as the product, and that's it, it's ruined. And that's where I think the notion of, you know, we're, we're all, we're all in this, you know, we're all the product really comes into. So at the end of the day, we all do have many chances to succeed, but that one moment is where you, is where you fail. And it's irreparable in many cases. So I have another story, and I don't have to walk to tell the story. It's going to be a little complex. And this one I'll call zombies. Um, so at Zappos, we um, had to value SEO um, pretty highly. You know, the competitive market, we had to make sure we reduced our marketing costs and not paying for traffic. So um, all the stuff we sold became valuable for us uh, from an SEO perspective. And eventually things would go out of inventory, we would stop selling brands, and we, would, we, we started realizing, oh, if we stopped selling a certain brand, we started losing traffic. And how can we maintain that traffic um, without creating a poor experience? And what I mean by that is if you don't want someone to search for a brand, hit your site, and all of a sudden you can't sell it to them, and that's, that's kind of a crappy experience, right? So we had a little fun with it. We, we got creative, and we started thinking, well, if we want to maintain the SEO value, um, but without pissing a customer off, I think there's a few, thing, a few things we could have tried to make that fun. So I'm going to show you what we did. So, this here is, you know, the listing of products that are no longer sold. And in the interest of just communicating culture, and communicating our personality, we played around a little bit. The second you went over here, the little zombie comes up. <laughs> and to simply denote that these are dead products, these aren't products we're selling anymore. Now, creating a little laughter, a little smile. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, you wanted to buy the product and, and you still may be upset, but but this is, you know, an opportunity to create a little bit of fun, a little bit of laughter um, <laughs> with your, with your uh, potential customers. And that sort of stuff goes a long way. This is the sort of stuff that the user experience department was responsible for at Zappos. Um, and this is the sort of stuff that was valued even more than, say, wireframing and creating, you know, the documents we're all used to creating. So, you know, most of our goals weren't really achieved in, in wireframes. I mean, like, I don't want to do little wireframes, and I still spend a huge amount of my time doing it, and it's, you know, lots of fun, I enjoy it, and it's very, you know, I, I like it. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, some of the moments you can create in an experience aren't necessarily achievable there. Nor are they achievable in, uh, it, by, the, by itself in developing a product, nor are they achievable in prototyping, or even in analytics. I mean, it's, I, I enjoy looking at analytics, I enjoy seeing what happened on your site, but that necessarily is not your, your measure of success. You know, measure of success, I think, is making your customers smile, even if they didn't complete the task they came to, to do. But if you made your customers smile, there's a good chance they're going to come back. So um, another thing that happened uh, at Zappos pretty regularly, is, like, seems like a good time to talk about it, would be uh, when they called us and we didn't have the product they were looking for, let's say we were sold out, um, it was it was behooved of us to put them on hold for a moment, or ask them if we could put them on hold, and look at five of our competitors, and then tell them what competitors of ours have the shoe they're looking for in stock, and send it, send them to that competitor to buy the product. Again, that's that's the customer experience. It's, they're going to remember that moment more than the incredible website we sent them to. They're going to remember the fact that we made them happy, that we satisfied their specific need. Um, who here has heard of Rick Rowling? Yeah. yeah. All right. You told me. Uh, cool. <laughs> Rick Rowling was probably one of my favorite things on earth for a period of still. And <laughs> uh, I don't know why. I don't know what it was. But, you know, we um, I got, got, kind of got infatuated with it. And so put that, put that notion aside for a second. This is our, this was our, well, it is Zappos' footer. In fact, it actually goes even further down the head off for the sake of less embarrassing. Um, but it's probably the longest footer you'll ever see in the history of a website. We call it footer source. And we were always looking for opportunities to have a little fun with our footer. Just, we actually got a lot of crap from the tech community, you know, always tweeting and talking about like how ridiculous our footer is, it doesn't serve any purpose. 
Well, it serves a purpose, right? You know, at first it was for SEO, but then we started to think about, like, let's have a little fun with this. Let's, let's try to find a way to get people to, to smile when it comes to us. There's a little link here, you probably can't read it. It says, don't ever click here. <laughs> <laughs> when they did it, this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's play for a moment. This is awesome. These dances are the best. Take every op- every possible opportunity we can to make someone to make someone smile and laugh. And it was that laughter, and it was those moments that gets people to come back. It's those memorable moments that got people to come back. So, really, the kind of philosophy, you know, that, that I try to bring with me in anything I work on. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I fail. Um, is give customers what they actually never knew they wanted. Um, and I think some of that just takes just a lot of risk, a lot of. You know, it means taking a lot of chances. It means being okay, falling flat on your face, as long as you can get back up. Um, but most importantly, it's a, it's a principle that I, that I take with me everywhere I go. And I would say that you know, a few months ago, when I wasn't <coughs> terribly happy in the job I was, I was at, I was thinking I needed to do something else. I need to keep myself uh, excited. And I'm like, I want to see if people are going to like this new idea I have. So I created something. And it's called dogstillmakeyourheads.com. <laughs> it's a site dedicated to dogs that tilt their heads. And what I what I believe I'm going to do in changing the world with this is make 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 the fact that dogs tilt their heads one of the most important things in the world. That's on that case. But the point is, you know, it, it, it's you know, it's little moments like this that I think get people to to smile and laugh and think and like think about something I never otherwise thought about, right? So all of a sudden, I'm in a situation where I'm getting, you know, gosh, at this point, it's like close to 100,000 views. It's only been up for a little over a month, but like a, about 100,000 views the first month around a stupid site about dogs tilting their heads. <laughs> point being, is if you make people smile and laugh, um, they'll come back. I mean, you could share photos on Flickr or Facebook anywhere, right? Um, but if you get people just to kind of overwhelming excuse to smile, I think um, it's a good experience. The site has so many flaws by typical design standards, but they're sometimes, you know, lost uh, and, and covered by, by dogs like this. <laughs> That's Stella. I know Stella. Look at that. She's not looking forward. She's just looking. <laughs> you know, I recommend everybody post photos of their dogs tilting their heads here. <laughs> <laughs> See, I gotta figure out what to do with the ones that don't tilt their heads. I don't want to be mean, but you know, it's more about the business Don't ask. Okay. So you know, I guess the question that. I'll ask. <laughs> I would say, like to, to all of us, like how can how can you create an experience that makes your users want more? And I think you know if you could always ask ask yourself that as you're creating anything and um, and try to validate it. I think you know we have a better chance of succeeding whatever it is we're trying to do. But I definitely don't believe it lives exclusively in creating wireframes. So if you are a user experience designer like myself, I would say try try to you know try to step away from the regimented approach to doing wireframes and think about how how it is that what you're doing could impact someone else's lives in a, you know, it's a fun, uplifting way. Uh, yeah, a great, a great we, we all like seeing a great you know, site design. I like it better than everyone else as well, but like, it's just, it's, that's such a small, minute piece of creating experiences. So definitely I want to say thank you with that, and ask me anything. I probably didn't cover anything or everything people want to hear about, so here I am, let's talk, and uh, I'm going to drink this beer while you guys think about what you want to ask me. <laughs>